I want to preach on thankful part two. I wasn't finished last week, but I got you out of here on time, right? And so this week we're going to finish it up, part two, thankful part two. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke, Luke chapter 10. The notes are in the church app, so if you want to follow along with, your, with the church app, you can follow along in the notes and fill in the blanks. <clears throat> thankful part two. So Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 1, the New Living Translation says, The Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. These were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. Now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. Thank you very much for these encouraging words, Lord. I am going to send you, you are a lamb, and I'm going to send you out there into a pack of wolves. I don't know about you, but just that, that idea just doesn't sound right. What do you think a pack of wolves would do to one little lamb? Right? Mmm. Thanksgiving dinner all over again. <laughs> right? But the Lord knows what he's doing, right? Because when you got Jesus on your side and you're a little lamb, you have power over the wolves in Jesus' name. Look at verse 9. He said, heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you now. Pray with me now. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. For your word is truth and it's life and it's breath and it's what we need. Lord, I pray, oh God, that today you would encourage us. That today we would look to you like we've never looked to you before. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe that we can live our life full of a lot of different things. You can choose to live your life full of negativity, pain, hurt, disappointment, or I believe you can make a choice to live your life full of some things that are good and pleasing and some things that are eternal, not just temporal things, but eternal things. I believe life is a choice. Now, we can't necessarily choose what happens around us, the circumstances, but we can choose how to respond to those circumstances. I can say that Dana and I have had 38 wonderful, amazing years of marriage. But to be perfectly honest, not all of them were that amazing. Come on. And you might have been married more than 20 minutes. You will understand what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> Uh, and we can say this church has been here over 30 years. We can say 30 years, 30 amazing years. But honestly, all, not all 30 of those years were so amazing. I mean, how can a church so diverse as this one possibly survive? We have Caucasian. We have Ameri South uh, African American. We have Asian, Spanish, Native American. We like Southern gospel, we like hip-hop, we like soul, heavy metal, opera, classical. How in the world could a church like that ever come together to worship? Because we don't identify ourselves as Republican or Democrat. We don't identify ourselves as black or white or brown. We identify ourselves as followers of Jesus Christ. We gather around one major thing, and that is the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's how we're able to stay together and worship together, even though we're so diverse in our thoughts, in our, in our lives. And I'm grateful that God has chosen me. God has chosen me because I'm so qualified. No, it's because I was available. And so many times we disqualify ourselves because we think we're not... We're not qualified, but the Lord wants us to be available. You ever heard of this guy named D.L. Moody? D.L. Moody wanted to be a children's pastor, and he felt the call of God on his life, but because the local church wouldn't allow him, well, they said, you don't have enough education, you, you're, you're not from the right side of the tracks, you don't have any experience, 
And so they, they just said, no, you can't be a part of this. You're out. You're, no way. We're not going to let you do it. So he said, okay. So he went out and found a few kids in a cemetery and used a tombstone as his, as his pedestal. And he began to teach them some Bible stories. And pretty soon he had a couple of hundred kids all piled around uh, in, in the middle of the cemetery. And the church, there, the pastor and all the deacons and everybody were looking out the window going, his church is bigger than ours. We better get him in here for he gives us a bad name. So they brought him in. He let him be the children's pastor. And next thing you know, revival struck because somebody was available. Come on. I want to preach this morning on thanks, thankful part two. Jesus, if you look at his life, he was someone that people wanted to be around. Children wanted to be around him. Why do children want to be around some adults? Because they're so fun. Because they're so, you know, kids like some people. You ever notice that they like some people and they hide from others? Right? Have you ever had to tell your kids when you get together at fam family holidays that make sure you go hug Uncle So and so? Now, why would you need to tell them that? Because he's the mean one. He's the cantankerous one. He's the one that's no fun to be around, right? You never have to tell them to go ha uh, hug Grandma or Aunt Bessie, right? Jesus must have laughed so much. He must have been so incredible that. Children were just mobbing him. They wanted to climb on him. They wanted to be around him. It was those grumpy old disciples that tried to hold him back. Right? What did Jesus say? Leave him alone. Let him come. Let him come. He loved the children. As a matter of fact, uh, Peter, unless you become like one of them, you're not even going to get to come to heaven. You're not going to inherit my kingdom. You better, get, you better get the grumpies off of you. Right? They say that adults laugh maybe four times a day. And kids laugh more than 100 times a day. I don't know where that statistic actually came from. But, but what happened from the time that we were kids to the time now that we're adults? I mean, what happened? Well, life. Life did it to me. Well, don't blame it on life. You can choose to still laugh. You can choose to be happy. When you were a kid and you saw a mud puddle, what did you do? You jumped in it. Right? And when, when you're with your kids, what do they want to do? Jump in it. But what do you do? Don't you jump in that mud puddle. What? Kids, you jump in that mud puddle. Go ahead. Be a kid. Right? I mean, we're guilty of domesticizing our kids, and we try to make them so much like adults. They will be, uh, they'll be adults someday. And so let them go ahead and jump and play and splash. You know, enjoy it because, you know, someday they're going to be a grumpy old men and and when they get about 40, and when I'm preaching, they won't even smile at me. You ought to look at you sometimes. You ought to be up here preaching at you. Come on. Jesus laughed. The scriptures record Jesus laughing. But before we get into that, I, I want to direct your attention to Luke chapter 10, verse 1, where Jesus appoints 72 disciples, and he's, he's getting ready to send them out. Notice what Jesus what he does, what he says about these 72 disciples, and he sends them out. The Lord, in verse 1, chose 72 disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places that he was planning to go visit. Now, if you're looking at your notes, number one, Jesus sent his disciples. That word is sent. He sent his disciples. Jesus sent his disciples because eventually... He was going to show up. He sent his disciples because he was eventually going to show up there. I have good news for you. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, he has sent you ahead of where he's about to show up. He is sending you. You're not just working where you work. You are not just going to school where you go to school. You are not just living next to the neighbor that you're living by. He has sent you ahead because he is going to show up and he's going to do something big. He wants to use you. Are you his disciple? Notice that disciples are always sent. They're not always sitting. As a disciple of Jesus, you may sit for a season, but you will go for a lifetime. 
it's okay to come to church and, and to sit and to listen and learn, but if you've been sitting around for a couple of years, it's about time for us to allow the Lord to send. He needs to send us. True followers of Jesus Christ, we have to understand that we have a mission. We have a, a commandment. It's not just sitting. It's to go into all the world and to preach, to share the good news that Jesus is alive and he's well. Come on, Jesus is alive. I said Jesus is alive. There we go. Just waiting for somebody to agree with me. <laughs> he sends them ahead. He sends his disciples ahead of him. And you are where you are because Jesus wants to do something in that place of employment or that school or that neighborhood because he's about ready to show up in that place. He's going to do something because of you. He's sending you ahead. Life is so much better when you realize it's not all about you. Life is so much better when you realize that it's not all about you. Did he just say that? Oh, man, he offended me. I thought life was about me. What? Now, if you stay in this church long enough, I promise that I will offend you. <laughs> the gospel at times is offensive. Yeah, it pulls us out of our self-centeredness, and it pulls us out of our comfort zone. And it, Well, the church is too cold. The church is too hot. Well, I don't like coffee. Why don't they have hot chocolate? Why don't they have cider? You know, well, nobody, somebody took my seat. I've been sitting there. I mean, last week you came in, and it was really crowded, and we added more chairs. Now it looks like it's not as crowded. So some people are complaining because it was too crowded. Now people are complaining because it's not, there's too many seats empty. <laughs> you know, that guy that sits next to me sings pretty bad. You know there are people in the world that will walk for miles to sit on a dirt floor in some third world country and be able to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ being preached? <laughs> Did you know that Rebecca, raise your hand, Rebecca, that she rides on the shuttle bus for three hours every Sunday to go to church and back home again? Three hours. She told me that last night. Sometimes it takes her an hour to get here in the mornings and two hours to get home. And yet she comes week after week after week. You know, you really ought to sit down with this little girl over here and ask her to tell you about her testimony, what Jesus has done in her life. God's doing something there. I'm grateful for this beautiful building. I'm grateful for the air conditioning in the summer and the heat in the winter and, and the padded chairs. When we first moved in, we had pews with no padding on them, and people kept bringing their pillows with them to church. And we even had extras for those that forgot. I mean, it's so amazing. You know, Jesus has done so many great things in our lives. You know, just being in the house of God together is an awesome thing. But there's something about American Christianity that just bothers me. You know, and I'm, I'm an American, born and bred. If the church house is not up to our comfort level... And we just check out. We just go somewhere else. We'll go to another church that's a little bit more plush, a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more techie, or a little bit less techie, whichever one you want. If they don't do church just the way I want them to do it, then I'm going to go somewhere else. I'll find me a church that'll do it my way. You know, I'm, I'm good with trying to make it comfortable. I'm, I'm, I'm good about make, being creature comfort, you know, and, 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 and making it easy for people. Yes, I want you to come to church. I don't want you to, I mean, if your hind end is hurting while I'm preaching, you're not paying attention. So we made you some soft chairs. Grace Place, back in the day, they're no longer, Grace Place is no longer, but they gave us all these chairs. We still have a hundred more downstairs. I'd love to bring them all up and fill them all up. That's up to you. It's up to you. That's not my job to fill the church pews. I'm the shepherd. You're sheep. Sheep beget sheep. Sheep make sheep. Y'all get that? So what? Some of you haven't been doing your job. You better get busy. You got an empty seat next to you? Fill it. Oh, no. Pastor's offending me again. <laughs> Jesus sends his disciples ahead of him. Is Jesus sending you 
Is he sending you ahead? If he has, will things be ready when he arrives? Here's number two. Jesus sends them out, and here's what he tells them. Number two, I want you to go out and see the great harvest. It's ripe. The harvest is ready. I want you to go out and see all the people that need me. Yesterday, I uh, woke up in the morning. You know, my battery in my truck has been getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And it was about at the end of life anyway. And so we woke up yesterday morning, and it was so cold that my her, battery was dead. Ricky had to come over with his jump box and jump me, and so we had to go over <laughs> the budget battery, and we had to get batteries. Well, there's two in my truck. Imagine, batteries are expensive enough, but it was about $280 for two, two batteries, right? So we're sitting there, and I'm watching this guy as he's putting my batteries in, and while we were there, right on Pacific Avenue in Parkland area, we watched people as they walked down the street, and, you know, and he's like, he just he notices these people, and he's like, I tell you what, he says, just working here on Pacific Avenue, it's amazing the kind of people that walk by. It's like, whoa, you know, I'm thinking, man. So I began to be a light. I mean, God is showing us people that need Jesus. We, God wants us to go out and see how many people. He wants us to see how big the harvest is and how few workers that he has. God says, I need you to see it. Jesus sent them out. I want you to see the harvest. Because if you see it, you will act on it. If you never see it, you will never act on it. And too often, we, we only see our little world. We, we are blinded by our little problems, our needs, and we never actually open up and look and see the harvest. We're too absorbed, self-absorbed. There are about 890,000 people living in Pierce County. That's almost a million people. If we add all the churches together, we're not even barely denting or putting a scratch in the population of Pierce County. In other words, if everybody in Pierce County wanted to go to church, they couldn't go. We wouldn't have enough room for everybody in Pierce County. And yet... Churches like ours sit with empty seats, and there's people lost all around us. The harvest is so ripe. And we think that, well, because they're not in church, they don't want to be in church. There are people out there just waiting for an invitation, just waiting for an opportunity. There's nearly a million people in our county that we need to open our eyes and see this great harvest field and that God, God is sending us into that field. We need to stop sitting because God is sending. He's sending us. You ever be bothered by something? You get bothered by things? If you get bothered by things, if things bother you, it could be an indication of why God puts you on this planet. Because if you look at an injustice and it bothers you, then you are probably the solution. Number three in your notes, be the solution to the problem. If there's something that's not right in this church and we're not doing something quite right, don't be critical or complain or get a group together to complain with you. Well, I'm going to get me a small group of complainers. I mean, if you have a, a passion in you, you are the answer to the problem. Here's our vision. Where's your vision? What is it? What is your vision for the church? Let's put them together and let's change Pierce County together. What do you see that nobody else can see? What bothers you? Does it bother you that people in our church go hungry? That people in our church may be homeless? Does it bother you that kids are unruly and they don't know about Jesus? Does it bother you that the church has very little outreach? Does it bother you that there may be people in our church who don't have any family to hang around with during the holidays? Does it bother you that some in our church are unemployed or 
underemployed? Does it bother you that we have young people that would like to go to college, but they don't have the ability to go to college? Does it bother you that some people don't wear nice enough clothes, maybe because they can't afford it? If it bothers you, then maybe you are the solution to fix it. I don't like to be around critical people. Especially when people say something like, I know what's wrong with your church. Yeah, sometimes there's people here that tell me, I know what's wrong with your church. So when people come to me and they tell me, I know what's wrong with your church, I usually just duck. If they come to me and say, Pastor, I know what's wrong with our church, I know there's a solution standing in front of me. But see, when it's your church, all they want to do is criticize. They don't want to help you. But when it's our church, Pastor, this is our church, and I have a, I, I have a problem here. And I know that there's a solution standing in front of me. This is our church. I don't own this church. How many of you know that I do not own this church? I can't sell it and move to Tahiti. <laughs> no, there's laws. I, I am just the pastor, right? We want to win souls. We want to tell people in Pierce County about Jesus. We want to tell people about the kingdom of God. Pastor, that's crazy. You can't win all of Pierce County. Well, it's almost as crazy as coming out of your tent, and you don't have any children, and God says, look up at the stars, and that's how many kids you're going to have. And his name is Abraham. He doesn't have any children, and he's 100 years old. Well, that's pretty crazy. But I believe that my God can do something extraordinary. Jesus says, go. Go into Pierce County. Go out into the harvest field. But it's too big. No, no, no. I want you to open your eyes and see. See the harvest field. Oh, and by the way, he says, when you see it, you're going to go, oh my goodness, there's so much work to do. And so he has a solution for that. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 2, 10 verse 2, so pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest, ask him to send more workers. We need help if we're going to reach Pierce County. So I've been praying. Lord, send more workers to our church. Send us people who want to reach the lost. Send people who can, can uh, grab a hold of the vision, their vision with our vision, and we can go together and we can win the lost in Pierce County. Go and pray. Jesus said, number four, pray for the workers. Pray for the workers. He didn't say pray for more worshipers. He said pray for more workers, more laborers. It's our vision to continue to build our dream team. A dream team, that's, those are the people that come to this church who are ministering, doing something to touch somebody's life. It's, it's my dream that everyone who calls Abundant Life Fellowship their church to get a God dream, a God vision. Go through the growth tracks, which come January. If you haven't been through the growth tracks, we're going to offer the growth tracks again in January. How many of you don't know what the growth tracks are? Okay, we got, we got a couple people who hadn't been through them yet. So we're, we're going to prepare. It's, it's four weeks. We do it for four Sundays right after church. We give you some lunch, and then we teach. It's one hour, and then at the end of the four weeks, mm, you are ready. Dive in with the team. Pick a team and serve. You know, if we don't have a team that's right for you, then we will make a team that's right for you. Come on, we're going to change Pierce County, and we're going to do it together. And we're going to pray the Lord of the harvest to send laborers. I believe that 2020 is going to be a significant year for Abundant Life Fellowship Church. 30 years ago, God gave me a vision. that He said that we will have a church that will send out a thousand, that will have a thousand ministries that are birthed out of that church. We'll send, we'll send out and we'll see 1,000 ministries as a result of the obedience of a church. Jesus said, pray for workers. Every single day, Lord, send us laborers. Send us leaders. Send us people, oh God, who have a burden for the lost, that want to see people saved. I mean, I am saved. I'm born again. I know I'm going to the right place. Why wouldn't I want everybody to go with me? Everywhere I go, 
some way, somehow. It may not even be with words, but I will express, I've got a guy at work. I've got to be careful because they watch these videos. But, but I have a guy at work who doesn't believe the same way I do. Something has changed in him. I'm not, you know, and I haven't ever, we, I've never talked Bible, religion. He's never said it to me. I know what he, what he believes and he knows what I believe. There's a big difference between us. But I've noticed a softening. Hmm. Yeah. I've noticed a softening. Jesus told his disciples, go into the city. The harvest is great. Pray for workers. But when you go there, when you go into the city, I want you to heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near. Number five in your notes, Jesus told them to be healers to their city. To be a healer. Wait a minute, wait a while. They're not pastors. No, they're disciples. He told them to go and heal the sick. Heal the people. Go into the cities and heal. Be a healer. Well, you can't be a healer and a debater at the same time. I don't debate. I share. I share my testimony. Nobody can, can argue my testimony. This is what's happened to me. And because of that, my life's been changed. I want to be a healer to Beers County. I want to heal marriages. I want to heal young people. I want to heal the sick. I want to heal mental, relational, physical ailments in Pierce County and beyond. The church is called to be a church of healers. Well, I'm going to invite you to come to church so you can be healed. My pastor can pray for you. No, you are a healer. Jesus has commanded you to go. He has sent you, if you call yourself a disciple of Jesus Christ, a follower of Jesus, he's called you to go, to heal. Come on. The kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus is coming. Jesus sent his disciples to go and to heal, go and to make a difference. That would be a big difference in the approach that people traditionally have been making. You ever seen those guys standing out on the corner with a bullhorn? Get right with God or you're going. about you, but I get a little embarrassed when I drive around people like that. I'm like, you know what? You're giving us a bad name. That's not what God's about. That's not what, you never seen Jesus doing that. Over on this corner, Pacific and, and, and 72nd, I see a church out there all the time because that's where a lot of the homeless people hang out, right there by that McDonald's. And I see this church out there all the time. They're not out there yelling at traffic. I don't know what church they are. But it's pretty obvious they're a church because all they're doing is they're out there loving people. And sometimes they'll have, they'll do services right there and they'll be preaching the gospel, but they're not screaming at people. They're sharing the gospel with people and they're touching people and they're feeding people. They're touching lives. We've, we've been trying to intellectually save people, but we need to heal people. I don't know about you, but if, if, you were hurting and you're down and out and somebody walked over to you and said, can I pray for you? And they touched you and you were healed and your pain goes away. That might change your life. You might listen to what they have to say. You're called to be a healer. Come on, church. Bring healing and hope wherever we go. Could you imagine being there when Jesus was sending out those disciples? And he sent you out with your partner. and He said, all right, go. And he gives you your commands and goes, and you walk up to people and you, you pray for them and they're healed. I imagine the first time you did it, you're going to say, okay, Jesus told me to do this. I'm gonna, okay. Okay, well, there's somebody who looks pretty sick. I mean, let's go pray for them. And then you pray for them and next thing you know, they're healed. Whoa. What does that do for you? Boost your confidence. Oh, yeah, maybe this Jesus stuff is real. Come on, you ever wondered? <laughs> huh, because, you know, sometimes I wonder because I got all these Christians that have the form of religion but no power thereof. Why? What's the difference? Faith. 
willing to put yourself out there? Willing to put yourself on a limb? I mean, can you imagine Jesus sends them out? People get healed, and now you tell them the kingdom of heaven is near you. What are they going to do? They're going to follow you. They're going to want to know more. People are hurting, and we have a commission to go out and to heal our city. Luke chapter 10, verse 17 says, When the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported, Lord, <laughs> even the demons obeyed. Whoa, can you believe it? Think about it. They, I mean, when we used your name, they ran like crazy. Like, they came back, they were joyful, and Jesus, you know, they, 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 Jesus, we believed you, and we, we, we went out and we healed people. We've seen it with our own eyes. Even the demons were, were subject to us. Jesus affirms, yeah, 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 I get all that, yeah, that's right. But this is what he said, look at verse 18. He told them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Yeah, look, I, I, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. You can walk among snakes and scorch, scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you, but don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from, like lightning from heaven. What was, what was he saying? What he's saying to us is Jesus was there when Satan got kicked out of heaven. But every time we go out into the world, every time we go out into Pierce County, every time we go out into the harvest field, and we obey the Lord, Satan falls again. Whenever disciples go and use the power of Jesus that he's given you, Satan is falling. Every soul that is saved, Satan is falling. Every child that is helped, Satan is falling again. Every young person that is reached, Satan is falling. Every person that is fed, every person that is clothed, Satan is falling. Every person that is sent to, do, to start a work, Satan is falling. Every unlovable person that you reach out to and love, every person you touch, every person you reach, every person you give hope to, Satan is falling. I want the devil to fall again and again and again and again. I want to see him fall. It's not just a young person being saved. It's a generation being changed. My grandfather, uh, Clyde Davis, was the first person in the Davis history to become a born-again Christian. And because he gave his life to Jesus Christ, he had five children who gave their hearts to Jesus Christ and all of their children. Now we've got hundreds of people who are following Jesus Christ just because Clyde Davis got saved and got married and had children and a family lineage of people living for Jesus Christ. And that doesn't even include all the people that are in his lineage who share Jesus Christ with people like me sharing it with you. But even as awesome as it is to see Satan fall, even though I've seen Satan fall, that is not the reason that we're thankful. That's not the reason that we rejoice. You need to understand why you should be thankful. It's because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. What does that mean? When you give your heart to Jesus Christ, they open the book in heaven, and your name is written. And then on that judgment day, when you stand before God, they're going to say, well, let's get out the book. Oh, here's your name. Welcome. Come on in. Enter into your rest. Or, I'm sorry, your name is not found. And a couple of angels grab a hold of you and dump you in hell. Oh, pastor, you just offended me. I'd rather offend you now than you be dropped in hell. Come on, church. Jesus is saying, don't get caught up in the power that you have. Don't get caught up in the influence that you have. Don't get caught up that Satan is falling. All that is good. That's all great. But get caught up in your position because your name is written. It's permanent. It's fixed. It can't be changed. The Bible says that nothing can pluck you out of the hand of God. Now, you, unless you walk out. 
My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. That's why I'm thankful. That's why I'm grateful. Not just because all the good circumstances and all, there's, there's still good times coming. There's still tough times coming. But I am thankful because my name and your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Be thankful about your position. When you're thankful about your position, more power and influence will flow out of that position. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I am a servant of the Most High God. I am nothing on my own. I am only something when I'm connected to Jesus, when His power is flowing through me. And I realize not everything has worked out for everybody. Everything didn't work out exactly how you hoped. I know there are tough times. You wanted to quit. You wanted to check out. You want to just end it all. Maybe that dream job never came. Maybe you just feel stuck. Listen, is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Then you have something to rejoice about. You have something to be joyful about. I'm closing. You can come to the music. Jesus, after he talked to his disciples uh, in verse 21, look at Luke 10, verse 21. At that same time, Jesus was filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit, and he said, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever, and for revealing them to the childlike. Yes, Father, it pleased you to, to do it this way. Jesus was filled with joy. Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. And that word, uh, rejoice, it's a really good word. It's a great word. In the Greek, it signifies spinning, dancing, and laughing. Whoa! Does anybody get confused on what that meant? Whoa! Everybody, everybody knows kind of, that's good sign language right there. I mean, everybody, if you do that, everybody's going to think, wow, that person's really excited about something. They're really happy. That person is full of joy, right? I can see Jesus spinning and dancing and laughing over the victories of his disciples. Could you imagine when his disciples came back and they're excited because, man, they're praying for people and they're being healed. <coughs> and they're coming back and the devil is running from them. I can see Jesus now going, yes, come on, yeah, high five. You did it! Bam! Yeah! That's how excited Jesus gets when you go where he sends you. Don't you like that kind of a Jesus? Or do you want the Jesus that's like, why didn't you? What? You were afraid? You didn't feel like it? Oh, you've got some struggles? I don't want Jesus to look at me that way. I want Jesus to say, good job, buddy. Yeah, you did good. Yeah, I'm proud of you. Verse 21, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. Oh, thank you, Lord, for hiding it from the wise people, the religious people, the people who are trying to get it all figured out. I had a friend who came to church here for a long time. This was years ago when we were back at Bridgeport, 40th of Bridgeport. We were in a storefront behind the Montessori School. The whole church was about as big as the, about here, that big. We all fit in here. And we went fishing together. We did a lot of things together. And I just kept telling him about the Lord. And he says, you know, there's, I'm not going to give my heart to God until I can understand. i got to understand it all. I said, buddy, you're going to be in hell before you understand it all. God is too big for us to understand. Come on. I can't figure him out. I don't know why he does what he does. All I do is serve him, and I just do what he says. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. Lord, you name it. I'm yours. I'm just available. He was rejoicing over his disciples who simply believed in 
Jesus laughed and rejoiced with them. Jesus is still laughing and rejoicing over you. As you go out to change the world, as you go out into the harvest field, remember that Jesus is laughing and rejoicing over you. It reminds me of the story four minutes late of the little boy who was out on the beach after a storm. The starfish were stranded all over the beach. And he would take one starfish and he would fling it back into the sea. And a man was standing up there watching him and he finally yells at the boy and says, you're not going to make a difference. You can't save them all. And the little boy looked down, picked up one. He goes, I'll make a difference for this one. You're not going to save the world by yourself, but you can make a difference for somebody. Somebody made a difference for you. Somebody made a difference for you. You can make a difference for somebody. Come on. Bow your heads with me now.